Hello, my name is Malia Prevot, and we are going to explore visual spatial skills and the impact on children and their education. First, we will define and discuss the components of visual spatial skills, areas that are impacted, how it presents in a child, feedback loops that impact learning, classroom accommodation ideas, and activities for home. So we have heard the term, but what exactly are visual spatial skills? Visual spatial processing is the skill that allows an individual to create an image in their head of an item, concept, or solution. The ability to process visual information in order to comprehend spatial relationships between objects and to visualize different scenarios or images. Visual spatial skills allow an individual to understand their position in space by taking in visual information from the environment and organizing that information so that they can recognize and understand meaningful patterns. Visual spatial processing can be broken up into different components. Visual perception is the ability to make meaning of visual information, that is to understand what they are seeing. Directionality is the ability to differentiate between the alignment and the orientation of an object in relation to its position to another object. Lateralization is how the brain controls both sides of the body. And bilateral motor coordination is the coordinated use of the two sides of the body. Directionality is the basis for reading and writing skills. Directionality is required to understand prepositions and directionality terms, such as left, right, top, bottom, etc. Some activities to build directionality skills are Pokey Pokey, Simon Says, Twister, and moving objects from left to right. Lateralization is an internal representation and sensory awareness of both sides of one's own body. Lateralization is required for the development of bilateral coordination and the ability to cross midline midline crossing. The body is divided into two vertical halves with an imaginary line. When children can cross their hands and feet from the left side onto the right side of their body, this is known as midline crossing. Some children feel a sense of spatial disorganization when they try to cross the midline of their body and thus avoid doing so. This will have a negative influence on laterality to develop a dominant hand. Lateral coordination requires communication between the two halves of the brain. The brain is separated into two distinct sides or hemispheres, which is bridged by a thick band made of millions of nerve fibers called the corpus callosum. This structure allows the two hemispheres to communicate with each other. Each side is responsible for controlling the opposite side of the body. For example, the left hemisphere controls the right side of the body and the right hemisphere controls the left. Bilateral coordination develops in sequence. First, the child develops symmetrical coordination, such as patty cake, catching a large ball, rolling out Play-Doh with a rolling pin, and jumping jacks. Asymmetrical coordination is when both sides of the body or the extremities are doing different movements in a coordinated effort to complete one calming task. Asymmetrical develops reciprocally and then matures into a leading hand support hand skill. Reciprocal activities are when the limbs are performing the same activity but alternating left and right, such as when climbing a ladder, crawling, riding a bike. Leading support hand skills are utilized when a task requires that one hand stabilizes an object while the other hand completes an activity such as writing, cutting, building Legos, stringing beads, opening a drawer with one hand while reaching inside with the other. This is when we start to see hand dominance develop. The performance of these types of activities strengthens the brain's communication and awareness of both sides of the body. Bilateral integration and coordination are frequently used interchangeably. We discussed that bilateral integration, bi meaning two, lateral meaning sides, is the coordinated use of both sides of the body working together to perform one task. Hand dominance helps to develop efficient hand dexterity, coordination, 
and strength, which is important in everyday tasks. The well-developed use of a working hand and a helper hand improves functional participation in daily activities. We're going to look at what areas are affected by difficulty with visual spatial skills. The processing deficit impacts a student's ability to organize and process visual information. Students may demonstrate poor handwriting and drawing abilities, have poor graphing and mapping skills, have poor organizational and note-taking skills, lose his or her place when reading, or struggle to line up numbers in math problems. Visual spatial skills are essential in day-to-day -day functioning. We use these skills to visualize or plan a task. For example, we use these skills when we imagine where a specific item is before walking into the room to get it. When we go on vacation or a trip, we visualize how different clothes items may look together before picking them out and packing them in our bag. Facial skills are particularly important when learning mathematics. During mathematical activities, students create a mental picture of an object that can be measured, moved, and transformed so that they can perform calculations and recognize patterns. Studies report that well-developed visual spatial skills are linked to better math performance. Difficulty with visual spatial skills can delay the development of gross motor skills. A child may have difficulty with coordination and balance, difficulty sensing body position and space, difficulty distinguishing between the directional terms such as left and right. They may have a difficult time with letter reversal errors during writing activities. As you can see here, the only difference between the letters B, D, and P are directionality. So it's easy to see why this could be challenging to a child who is struggling with these skills. Difficulty with directional concepts within reading, starting on the left and scanning right, or moving line to line. Have inconsistent hand dominance, or difficulty crossing the midline, which is the imaginary line down the center of the body. In addition, visual spatial perception can affect also letter sizing and placement. Based on what we have seen already, we can determine that reading and math skills can be greatly impacted. Visual spatial skills are also linked to logical reasoning skills. This is the ability to plan your actions based on what you are seeing. Logical reasoning skills enable us to perform activities such as playing chess, crossing the street, abstract thought, solving word problems, crossword, word searches, and jigsaw puzzles. Now that we know what can be affected, let's discuss what this picture may look like. A child who is having visual spatial deficits is likely to have difficulty navigating the environment. They may appear clumsy, klutzy, or awkward. They may have difficulty following spatial directions or instructions such as write your name on the top of your paper, put your homework in the folder. They may have difficulty understanding the orientation of alphanumeric symbols. This is the combination of alphabetic letters, numbers, and special characters, such as used in a mailing address. The child may be unorganized or easily distracted by excessive visual stimuli. They may have poor attention to visual information or tasks, or they may even be seen rubbing their eyes due to strain. Since we need visual spatial awareness to function efficiently in our day-to-day -day life, these difficulties can lead to anxiety and distress, resulting in a lack of self-confidence. Common side that a child is struggling with bilateral coordination is difficulty or avoidance crossing the midline. Ways a child may avoid crossing the midline could be swapping hands when approaching the midline, turning worksheets more than 45 degrees, turning their body in the chair excessively. This is to move the midline. Moves a page to the dominant side when writing. Doesn't develop a dominant hand. Picks a ball with the foot closest to the ball rather than the preferred foot. Struggles to catch a ball when thrown off center. Or will choose one hand for fine motor skills and one hand for gross.
We are going to examine a couple of feedback loops that are essential in learning. The first loop we'll look at is the phonological loop. This is a sensory feedback loop, which means there's a sensory input, motor output, and then a sensory input. The phonological loop is an element of the working memory and is essential in how we process spoken and written material. Working memory is also important for reasoning, learning, and comprehension. Complex reasoning and learning tasks require a mental workplace to hold and manipulate information. This is the working memory, much like a mental whiteboard. With the phonological loop, first we see it, say it, hear it. We see it, sensory input through our eyes, say it, motor output through our mouth, hear it, we perceive or hear what we just said, sensory input through the ears. Read it, rehearse or say it out loud, and then hear what you said. The next loop we're going to look at is the orthographic loop. The orthographic loop picks up where the phonological loop leaves off. Hear it, write it, read it. So you hear what you just said, sensory input, write it down, motor output, see or read what you just wrote, sensory input through the eyes. Students with weak orthographic processing skills do not develop a visual memory of sight words and letter patterns because they aren't able to make a mental picture of words in their brain. Since they are not able to visualize the words in their mind, they rely on phonics to read and write. This can cause their reading to be choppy because they must decode all words rather than rely on sight words. The phonological loop and the orthographic loop work in conjunction, and with repetition, a student develops a storehouse of words in their long-term memory. These words are quickly and easily recalled to allow them to read without sounding out each word. This is a lot of information, but leaving out any of these steps leaves out an important part of the loop. Missing these steps are when we start seeing reading disorders, and processing difficulties. This link has a great video that describes this process in more detail and may be helpful if you're interested in more information and how you can use these sensory loops in the classroom. Here are some classroom accommodation ideas. So a quick review, accommodations are ways to change a learning activity without changing the integrity of the information learned or presented and provide all students with equal access to content. Accommodations can involve changing the learning environment, changes in the way information is presented, changes in how a student demonstrates what he or she has learned. In addition to interventions provided by the occupational therapists, there are some accommodations that can be made within the classroom to improve the carryover of skills gained in related services and help reduce the risk of the child falling behind. Accommodations that work for each child can be as individual as the child themselves. It is important to remember that what works for one child may not necessarily work as effectively with another. So ideas are you can give the child instructions in different modalities. Say the instructions out loud, demonstrate them, and provide a handout. Provide alternate writing paper, such as paper with raised or thickened lines or dotted paper for writing. Facilitate activities that require multi-sensory feedback, how the information is delivered, as well as how the response is provided. Utilize devices such as tablets where the screen can be enlarged. Being able to zoom in on an image or problem decreases distraction caused by excessive visual noise. Write directions in a different color from the rest of the assignment, such as color coding tasks in general. Encourage students to ask questions when they are confused or feel lost in the content. Teach students to self-talk as a method of problem solving. Provide uncluttered handouts and decrease visual stimulation on chalk or whiteboards to reduce visual noise that can cause distraction. Use colored markers for math problems and have the student complete the work in pencil to differentiate between their work and the problem. When using visual demonstrations or models, be prepared to move slowly and repeat demonstrations as needed. Using touch screens can be helpful when writing is painful or difficult. 
provide a tool to guide the eyes when scanning during reading, such as a ruler, a card, or their finger. Use reading books with large print, which can make letter processing easier. Provide breaks or alternative activities to allow the child to rest their eyes. Processing visual stimulus for long periods of time is exhausting. Have lesson activities that require the use of their other senses. Pair children with a note-taking buddy. When planning activities, be aware that learning a lesson and writing at the same time can be challenging. Use gestures when teaching and encourage the student to use gestures. Gesturing is a powerful communicating and teaching tool. Research shows that children learn better when gestures are used rather than speech alone. Gesture is closely related to spatial thinking and reasoning skills. Encourage your student to close their eyes and visualize what they have just read or learned. Have students draw pictures of the information they have learned. Building a model of what they have learned can help strengthen understanding of learned materials. Use math manipulatives to demonstrate understanding of math concepts or watch videos that are related to the academic material. Take visual thinking breaks that involve solving visual spatial puzzles or playing visual spatial games. Use reading materials that are highly illustrated. Use visual anchors to identify boundaries on desks and on paper, such as a colored line on their desk, raised or colored line on the paper, or you can mark paper to show the child where to start and where to stop. Mark the child's desk with left and right markers. When writing on the chalkboard, help the child keep their place by writing each line in a different color. Provide tactile experiences such as sandpaper letters, form letters with Play-Doh or pipe cleaners, or outline letters or words with glue, let it dry, and then they can feel the letter. Writing on a slanted surface such as a three-ring binder may help increase their visual field. Have the child write on every other line. It's easier for them to read and make corrections. College ruled paper may be easier than wide rule. Try it and see. Provide the child with letter and number charts to help him or her remember how to form symbols when writing. Here are some additional activities parents or guardians can perform at home. Use directionality terms that describe the relative position of items and people in space. Inside, outside, under, around, corner, on top of, at the bottom of, in front of, behind, diagonal, across, etc. Create different shapes like squares, circles, spheres, triangles, and pentagons. Dimensional adjectives are terms that describe the size of space, objects, and people. Large, small, long, short, big, and tall. Spatial features are terms that describe the features and properties. Straight, bent, curvy, corner, side, line, pointy, sharp, or edge. Have your child repeat the words back to you and explain what they mean. Encourage your child to use these terms as well. Children who use spatial terms tend to perform better in spatial reasoning tasks. Ask questions that help them make the connection between spatial relationships and their environment. Is the soda inside or outside of the glass? Do you think the ball is under or behind the chair? I see Lily across the street. Use tangram and non-jigsaw spatial puzzles, especially those with multiple solutions. Map reading. This helps to develop abstract concepts of space and improves understanding of spatial relations that are not regularly experienced in the physical world. Games such as Tetris support the development of visual spatial skills. Copy a Lego or block structure. Build a simple structure using building blocks and then ask the child to match it in shape and color. Increase skills with the I Spy game. Use different colors to see visual differences in writing strokes when doing homework. To pr practice and increase skills, ask students to retrieve objects for you using directional terms. Can you get me the scissors on top of the shelf by the games? Gradually get less specific with your directions. 
Crossword puzzles help to develop language and spelling skills as well as using spatial relationships. I am a 45-year-old occupational therapy student. I am married with four children and one granddaughter. My motivations are my family and my passion for occupational therapy. Hobbies I enjoy are growing roses, orchids, and being a nanny. I have worked as an occupational therapy assistant since 2004. I received my bachelor's in psychology from Western in 2019. Following my field work, I will graduate with a master's in occupational therapy from Cabarrus College of Health and Sciences. This presentation was completed as an assignment during my current clinical rotation. I chose this topic because it was interesting and important to myself and a current client. Again, my name is Malia Prevo. Thank you for your time and all that you do. References are used for this presentation.